board. So um, we've got measure of a man, the article we'll, we'll go through. This is kind of also, this is one we've looked at before. Um, so it should be a review if you guys, pretty much all of you guys have been on the call for a while now. Um, so it should be a bit of a review, just more like some, some level three prep going through that. Uh, but I, I want to take it and kind of grow on it from what we did last time more into like coaching and seeing um, and it kind of will, it will go right into that deadlift, that quick deadlift video that I sent with James Hobart. Um, so for, for measure of a man, considering it's a review, what's some, some quick takeaways, thoughts, things that popped out that we revisited? So I've been thinking about this concept a lot um, because just I've been obsessing about like squat angles and basically I learned a lot about like femur bones and the length of a femur bone really having so much of a, it dictates so much of a position in a squat. And so what I was hoping to get more from this article was what other joints or bones that have different, I, I, I can hips i could definitely understand the hip sockets being able to be more open or closed based on how the hip socket is designed but i'm thinking of like more of like shoulders like i wanted to hear if the if the humerus bone is longer then it's going to cause limitations with an overhead position or something like that okay so i've got some, i've got some of those notes jot, jotted down here and um, we are going to start with the arms because i think I know the first time I read this, my fastest takeaway was just femurs. Like I walked away with legs only and it was extremely, extremely helpful for, for seeing and adjusting people there, but I didn't really walk away with anything for like the arms. Yes. Um, so our arms is going to be a big factor. We'll get into that like first. Um, before I do, it was any, any other thoughts that you guys had? Yeah, I had like some of them. Like the first one is like how... In anatomy, how they they teach you that um can change the the variance of the normality, but also how we can like you know like have one more bone, one more vertebra, or like um long humerus or long femurs and stuff like that. Um, but um, one more bone on different different areas. Uh, but um, then how we also train people with conditions like dwarfism have you seen the the how they lift on dwarfism the there's that guy they do overhead. Super strong yeah he's, fun, he's, he's kind good. of fun to watch yes and i've i've never trained anyone with any any uh condition that that it can measure different measures or different um or well targets and then the last the last one is that this is our week that we are doing um bring a friend so yesterday alone i saw people that are not like your regular normal crossfit yeah so yesterday i was like a a big guy um a very tall guy that i i in, immediately when i thought when i look at him i was like oh this guy is going to be flat and i had that bias already in my mind and <clears throat> And he couldn't, it was, he was flat on the power clean, the setup of the power clean. I'm like, okay, that's normal. I asked him if he had any, any problem. And he said, no, but then I noticed that the squats, he couldn't squat. And I'm like, I, he was squatting with, with pain. And I'm like, and I was, I come, I came to him and I'm, are you, do you have any pain? And he said, yeah, I have a problem in my knees. So then even if I was biased to already think that that was a normal for him, it was something else. And I, corrected him he actually could go like kind of lower so even if you already see a person is like okay this person is going to be like that try to uh, that that was my my also reading this and taking from yesterday so i think that's a that's a, a really good point you bring up because it kind of even with well, like what justin was saying with the arms it kind of are automatically made me have the thought that even though everyone's going to look slightly different we still are going to look at some like main points, right. And some like main points of performance, like just because someone has long, you know, longer femurs 
doesn't mean we're still not going to look at like weight in the heels and like where the shoulders are lining up with the barbell, right? Um, this article had a really good, that picture, and it was actually with arms, not legs, but it had the three side-by-side -side, um, deadlift setups and they were all different. But if you looked at all of them, where that line was going through was the exact same point and the shoulders were like slightly in front. So like those things that we look at to help our coaching are like cheat sheets, basically, that if you don't know if somebody has long legs, short arms or whatever the case may be, you're kind of looking at those things and you're like, is that good? Yes. Then it puts them in a good spot. Um, but it, but it is like getting used to seeing different people, especially when it's not somebody you coach every day really does like make you think more and like have to test things. Um, let's start with the arms. I'm going to kind of quiz you guys as we go through today a little bit for arms, for short arms, what would that do in like a hinge setup? So like a deadlift setup or a clean setup. You have to be, the torso has to be closer to the floor. Yeah. So if the torso is closer to the floor, that means their hip is going to have to be higher. We've got to bring the chest closer to the barbell, right? So shorter arms is going to be a little bit of a higher hip than normal. Hmm. So if short arms is a higher hip. What is long arms going to be? Okay. Lower hip, right? We've got to bring where the arms attached away from the barbell a little bit so they have space. Here's where it gets tricky. For a front rack position, if we've got, and this is more specific to like forearm, if someone's front racking, if they have short forearms, where's their front rack going to go? Like as far as hand placement on the bar goes, this is where it gets a little tougher. Like closer to your shoulders? Yeah, closer to the shoulders, more narrow. Um, if you try to bring them out wide, now you're demanding all of this rotation that they may also not have. Um, so it's going to be a shorter, shorter rack position. Um, and as long as, like, you have somebody that's not, like, have you ever seen those people that, like, collapse in? As long as it's not all collapsing in, we're in a good spot. That's what I would look at there. So longer forearms is going to be, obviously, a, a wider grip. Overhead position. And this is one that you would think of like, and it would be more affected in like a snatch grip or like an overhead squat. That's where you're going to see this have to vary a lot versus just outside the shoulders, generally overhead for the most part. Should be the same for most people, barring just like shoulder flexion, but you could be short arms or long arms and still have tight shoulders. Um, for an overhead squat or like a snatch grip, Short arms is going to have to be where? More narrow. More narrow, right? And what are we going to look at in that? Like if, if I'm adjusting somebody and I'm, I'm about to teach them how to overhead squat and their barbell is overhead, how am I going to decide where to go? How close it is to their head? Exactly. Yep. I'm going to look at that gap. We need to make sure I have breathing room there. Um, we've all been in a class or taught a class where someone goes really wide because they have tight shoulders. And it's kind of funny because it's a PVC pipe, so it's fine for a half second. But the PVC pipe's like right here, and you're like, dude, that would be such a bad idea if that was a barbell. So, um, so yeah, we're going to look at the length there. And obviously, um, longer arms can be a, a, a wider grip. The shitty thing about that is I've had some dudes that are so big that are at the end of the barbell and it's kind of like you wish the barbell was longer and they could use it, but it is what it is. Uh, Justin, what were you going to say? So I was curious if using the hip crease test would be the same regardless of like forearm length. So I would use that regardless, just as like a, you could use it as just a starting point. Um, as far as short arms, long arms, no, it would be different because if you have longer arms, like if you're doing a clean, I mean, if you're doing a snatch, yeah. But I mean, if you, if you're doing, it would be for it would be, it would be for snatch. Oh, yeah. Then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Clean, clean would be different. Um, it should generally put in the same spot because you know, you if you need to get it, if you have longer arms and you need it in your hip crease, you have to widen. 
if you have short arms, you need it in your hip crease, then you would be narrower. So it should generally put them in a pretty good spot. Um, okay. Even when testing that, I still bring people overhead. Um, Cause if I'm teaching overhead squat or snatch, I'm still going to teach them, you know, the external rotation, the active shoulder, and I'm going to look at like frontal plane. Um, so that, that should still be pretty um, applicable. Um, you can also always like, sometimes a slightly easier one to do is like the shrug and, and PVC pass through test and have them inch until they can't. Sometimes that puts in a good spot, but like, I would say those spots are general. They're, they're get you in a starting point. You still may adjust people from, from there. So is there a, is there like, um, something of, that happens that you can tell if your grip is too wide in snatch. For example, my snatch, I've been curious. I'm like, God, I feel like my grip is so wide because as I cycle four or five or more, then my hands start sliding in naturally and they find like a new space that it's more narrowed, but it feels better. And I'm like, this, this, should I be here the whole time? Or should I still take it wider, which is at my hip crease? So it's a, tr it's a tricky question. And I'm going to say why, because I'm going to go through all the factors that you're going to look at, like when it comes to snatch grip, like obviously what we just went through, like you need to have a safe spacing above your head with that barbell overhead, like that has to happen. We can't have a piece of steel by our brain, especially with heavy loads. Um, so that's going to be a factor. Shoulder flexion is going to be a factor too, because like if we're, if we're snatching, I need to be able to get into a point where I can maintain all my points of performance if I'm landing in a squat snatch. You know, with the active shoulder, nothing's giving. But then in the same token, the wider I go, the more stability is going to be required. Like, I'm going to start to lose stability there. Versus if I start to narrow it, I gain stability. So if I can find this sweet spot that I'm in a good length, I've got a good gap between my uh, head and the barbell, I've got good stability, but I've got good flexibility and range of motion, especially in the squat. And then the last thing to think of is where is that bar, especially for a snatch, brushing through the, the pole? Like, is it making contact with the hip and brushing through or is my contact too low? So it's like you're taking, you're taking the storm of all of those factors and trying to find the perfect spot for you. Does that make sense? Yeah, especially the last one that you mentioned. That, I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, like we don't always talk about that brush in CrossFit, but if yeah. you talk to like a, a higher level Olympic weightlifter, like they're looking to have that brush at the highest point possible, like especially in that hip crease, um, because when they're doing those maximum loads, like a quarter of an inch is the difference of them getting under that barbell. So like for them, it, it matters. Um, for us, I don't want to say it doesn't matter, but it, it's probably not the first factor. I would say the first factor is what's going on overhead. And then the last factor would be in the hip crease. But if you're like hitting the top of your thigh and you're nowhere near it because you're too narrow, then I would widen it get closer to that hip. So you're kind of blending it. You're making this cocktail of, of where to go. But um, have you heard it or is it normal that hands do start sliding in on cycling snatches? I've never heard someone doing it on snatch, uh, but I it happens to me on like thrusters. I typically like to, to oh, clean. It happens to me in, in the snatches it because it's like more more comfortable. Well, yeah. you we have flexibility, and um and and you can pull like shorter. You can pull better when you get tired. Tired. It happens to me. Actually, well, yeah. I, when I. When I get tired on, on overhead squats, I start changing this way because I can't have the flexibility gaining, to do it. And you're gaining and more shoulder more stability. Stuck. But yeah, also yeah. it's the position of the bar in the hand. Like there's, it balances better when it's more narrow versus out far wide. It's like, you're not able yeah. to really hold it as close. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the, and the, and the grip, especially for a snatch kind of like is funky. Um, I think the grip is, is a lot of times like mistaught. Um, like on how that should feel in the hand and people like over grip the barbell when in reality it's like that hook grips in and your hands is almost getting pulled like sideways to an extent um, Catalyst Athletics just put a, a post on that I'll try to find it and send it in our group just so you can see what I'm talking about um, so it, it just maybe you're kind of naturally finding more comfort so like for me and my thruster I like to clean a little bit wider 
because I like to feel it closer to my hip, but that position and my external rotation doesn't go real well. So I start to slide in and my grip gets more narrow as I go. And it's just, I think my body finding where it sits better, essentially. Cool, thank you. Um, that being said, little hacks. When I'm snatching for heavier load, I have my hands in a spot. When I'm cycling and it's like 75, 95, maybe up to like 135, I actually do narrow out just a hair because I know my personal weakness is the hinge and not the, the, the third pull of the bunch. So I take like an inch from me going to the floor on purpose. Um, so there's like some nuancey things that people tweak there too, just based on like them personally. I wouldn't tell anybody to do that because maybe their pull's fine and it's more of this position that's the problem. Um, any questions or any other thoughts like on the arms? Short arms, long arms. Long arms, more range of motion. That sucks. Sucks for them a little bit. Mm -hmm. But easier wall ball shots and row climbs. <laughs> and rowing. Yeah, rowing. That's a big one. Um, all right, let's go. Legs. While we're on this topic, can you go down the list of other things that long arms would be are better or worse at? Yeah. Better. <laughs> To be honest, I think, I think that's in, it, no? in, in general, being tall, there's a lot that's working against you. Because like, people even complain about a wall ball shot, and they're like, oh, but you barely have to throw it. If you look at the distance they have to squat to get below parallel and the, the one that the short one, like, it's probably a balance out as far as it like, energy out, output. For sure. So I, I know it's a, it's a hot topic on like that person's tall, that push, person's short, but it, it's coming for full circle somewhere. Um, I would say advantages are throwing the ball of a wall ball shot, but not necessarily the rest of the squat because if they probably have really long arms, they probably also have long legs, um, which is not always true. I do know some people with long arms that are average height and they don't have long legs. Um, what else? Just for fun. I guess all the machines. The mach yeah. The, 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 the Especially the pull machines, like the ski. Yeah. The ski, it's just they probably can cut range of motion down. Um, the rower, obviously, they can get further in front, so they get more pull. The bike, same, I would say. That one really doesn't change change a whole lot because the bike is locked in place regardless of your height. Um, yeah, I, I, that's why you see CrossFit Games athletes are all within, most of them are within this height category. All right. Finally, a besides, win for the short dudes. Besides, Brent, it really, besides being a horse jockey, CrossFit's your sport if you're not super tall. <laughs> but I think mm -hmm. horse jockeys can't even hit five foot. I think they're like a 4'11 situation. Um, yeah. <laughs> our, looking at our legs, let's go like set up position, um, like for a pull off the floor, like a deadlift clean. Short legs, where are the hips going to have to go? Uh further down like almost yep. sitting down sitting down i think this is the this setup is like the most applicable that you can use the fastest um short legs is also going to look like what in a squat typically not always like short femurs it's going to be a lot easier for that person to be very upright in their squat that oh. that, that, that lever is just a lot smaller um Long legs, where their hips going to go, as I said it earlier. Okay. There's a sensor. Yep, they're going to go higher. Um, and then you have, like, the point in the decision to be made. If it's just a, a person, you know, and they're, they're recreational and crossfitting, and they're just looking to be healthy, it may be better to widen their feet a little bit. So those does not necessarily even go to a sumo. But even just widening out a little could give them the space to get into a better position. Um, and then at a certain point, potentially going to like a sumo deadlift could be more appropriate as far as safety goes. Um, so it's something to do. But don't be afraid to like, if the feet are perfectly under the hips, take a tiny step out can help. A tiny um, pivot with the toes out can also help get them into a good position. And again, we're looking at like, where are the shoulders lining up to the bar? And do they have... A nice neutral spine. Um, any comments on the legs? So a long leg person 
will have a little bit more of a hip hinge in their squat, most likely. Would the length of the legs have any relevance on the uh, position of the feet in a deadlift? Like, should they be, they wouldn't make a difference to either turn the toes out or walk the feet out maybe a little bit further. Most people, deadlifts is closer. So t typically, typically what I've, I've found is, and, and you can watch people in the room and sometimes see this happen and they don't mean for it to happen, is usually when things are tighter, like, feet will slide around to find space um so a lot of times when you have like tight hips tight hamstrings and you're putting or you're putting trying to get somebody that's really tall like that like into a position really get down something's going to start to give and you'll see the feet slide out so sometimes with bigger people taking the feet and just i mean very slight not like a squat even but just making it so it's a five degree angle out can add a lot of comfort um I don't know if that would directly affect like the height. It could give them just more room to push their knees out potentially to, to get into position. Um, but I knew, do know like tight hamstrings, tight hips, that can help people a lot. And if people do start straight and they have very tight hamstrings as they're deadlifting, you'll see their feet. Or sometimes it's only one foot will start to like peel because it's just, there's a lot of tightness in there and the, the hips are trying to find space somewhere. Most of the time you see other faults going on with the deadlift because of them getting in through those range of motions are hard because of like inflexibility. Would you, would you consider that people with long femurs have more shallow squats like like on the the against the knee, their knee, they go like just there and it's like harder to spot if they are going deeper. Yeah, it's gonna be a lot easier for the person with a short femur to get under go like ass to grass they're, they're yeah. sitting is, is going to be that being said i've seen some very tall dudes that can sit like that um mm. but i think their me their measurements of their body is all equal like you know how the article talked about everything balances out i think when you see somebody taller able to do that typically everything's balanced versus when someone just has long femurs and let's say i have the femurs of a 6'3 guy but i'm 5'10 then, then the, the squat depth is going to start to get tricky. Like, and they'll start to lose some points of performance while it's trying to get down there. Would it be um, safe to say that you should, like, the longer the femur, maybe, th like, the wider they should have their stance? Like, their, yeah, their squat stance? Definitely adjust stance. Like, so, typ typically bigger is going to be a, right. a little bit wider. So then to the deadlift point that you said, like, okay, bring their feet out a little bit not necessarily into a sumo stance, but then they're going to be like, their hands are going to have to shift as well. Other, other ways, you know, they're going to. Yeah. Their grip will have to get wider. Their grip will have to adjust. That's like one of those is what it is. And, and I mean, when I say like, bring the feet out, like a slight, bring the feet out. Yeah. Like I wouldn't go to this, you know, when you get a new person in class and they're like, they're not in a, they're like in a squat stance to deadlift. And it's yeah. like their legs are literally in the worst part. I don't even mean that far out because then that starts to get to the point where it's better to just bring the hands in and go more to a sumo. So, um, sorry, so. can I say one more thing or ask yeah, one yeah. more thing? Remember that guy when I went to uh, Riptide before you had left that he, I think he was deadlifting or he was cleaning and then you had him put his heels together and his feet out and he felt so much better in that position i can't remember his name oh i i i, I remember vaguely um what we were talking about yeah sometimes you get really tall people and you can bring their feet in but they push their knees kind of like you guys remember Hunter i was squat? i was Hunter just squat? remembering remember and these these people african weightlifters that they actually do that and they go super wide because they are long arms mm -hmm. long legs and they go like very this way and then the knees goes it pointing. gives them it gives them the space to get into these like safe positions so you do see that um i think that's yeah. much much more on like the rare side of things um but it's if you watch weightlifting meets i don't know how nerdy you guys want to get but sometimes if you just watch random ones you'll see people that come up and you're like what is this guy doing and they, they literally like put their heels together and their toes out and that's how they're able to set up in the position um so 
I don't think you're going to really do that. That's going to be not the norm. And then that's, I think, also leading more to like probably a, a weightlifting coach, like specialist. Um, just while we're on that topic, have you guys ever watched the Masters weightlifting meet? Yeah, they do powers. They do a lot yeah. of powers. And you notice that they do a lot of splits. Yeah. They it's do a lot of split, split snatching. They do a lot of split cleaning. You guys know why that is? Because they don't have the mobility anymore. Right. They don't have the flexibility right. from when they were younger. Um, so doing a split snatch and a split clean allows them to get lower, and it doesn't put as much stress like in the hips so they can maintain position. Um, so just but I've tool. seen them doing power cleans, power um, snatch. They don't not, really go. Not many of them squat anymore. Um, they just, I, I don't think they really have the, the ability to, they would compromise them too much. Um, but just a tool in your back pocket, like if you ever do have somebody that's really, really tight and they're pretty athletic and it's, you know, a master's, it, a split snatch may be a better option for them. We've got a guy um, at our gym that I didn't contribute my thoughts to this, but he was, con he's won the games a, a few times. He's a really good athlete. He's a master's. And he was contemplating working on split snatch because he's like, I just can't receive low enough in a snatch. I thought it was a great idea. One of the coaches didn't like the idea and they said, don't do that. And I, I think it was a miss on their part. I think split snatch potentially could have benefited him a lot. But do you think maybe they don't do it because they think it's like a liability? They could get hurt? Um, We had seen somebody, I think, like, I don't know if it was a quad or like pull the patella tendon in the land. Um, but I think if you're at the point where something like that's going to go, it was probably going to go anyway. It's not because they did a split, uh, you know, a split land. Because what's the difference in te saying, no, it's too dangerous to do a split snatch, but then you're teaching them a split jerk. Oh, yeah. It's the same load. It's the same landing. So, uh, so maybe it's think, just he wasn't educated enough on that to even know. Yeah, probably. And just not really like thinking of some of those things. Um but that's just a good tool to have in you guys' back pocket occasionally. And if you just want to change things up in your training, I think the most fun thing to do is dumbbell split snatches and dumbbells are like split jerks with the dumbbell. It, it makes yeah. you think a, it makes you think a lot. It's still a good uh, good stimulus. Didn't we yeah, have but... that in one of the opens or it was some qualifier or something? I think we had that. I don't think we had it in the open. Um, Waterpalooza did dumbbell split snatch one year at Waterpalooza. Um, and you had to alternate arms and legs. And then the games had dumbbell clean and split jerk and dumbbell snatch um, for one of the events one year. So Maybe we've seen it. Program. I probably programmed it because of the games because I thought it was cool. Probably. 100%. I do that still, still too. It's fun. It <laughs> has a beer in, in CrossFit.com though, because I remember that I was following one time and it was like one, 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 one split snatch. And it's hard. Yeah, and, and it's I remember not. that in 2013, the open that it was snatches. They said you can do it this way, this way, and this out. way. And one of the day, one of the ways was a split snatch. And people laugh at like, oh, so who's gonna split snatch and split clean? Those people, like, like it doesn't make sense to us because we don't have to do that, and it's less complicated. But that's who's doing that stuff. A um, single dumbbell or, or double dumbbell. Single. I, I mean, you can do double. That would just be real interesting. I think. I can't. Um, I can't visualize either one of these in a split. So a lot of times when they do single dumbbell, they'll split whatever legs going in front will be the opposite leg. So if I do right hand, my left leg will go out. If I do left hand, my right leg will go out. Um, I like them just because it changes things up. But like neurologically and like getting into a groove like that, I think it probably can help people click on splitter. I had a client one time that I started her with dumbbell. Um, single dumbbell split snatches and split like cleans before I put her on a barbell um, just to get her used to the feet splitting. Um, some of those weird nuancey things, that being said, like kind of tying back to the article, did you guys kick up that Mark Ripperto talked about, especially in the clean, when you have people with longer arms, longer limbs, that you're not always going to get a brush in the hips? that sometimes the contact is going to be like on the thighs and that that's okay. Um, 
I know when I was very early in my coaching career, there was a girl I used to lift with all the time and she used to always hit very low on her thighs and I hated it. But I realized like I couldn't tell her to get to her hips because then she would have to bend her arms. Um, and I could blind her grip out of hair, but it wasn't going to get her there. The biggest takeaway and like thing to look at, regardless of in a clean where that contact's going to happen, is that it's not a punch out, that it's still a brush through and up. So whether the contact's on the thighs, we still have a vertical bar path, or it's in the in the hip, it's still a vertical bar path. Like that would be the coaching point, not, hey, I need you to get to the hips. Because what he said, I think is so true. You're just going to have an early pull. You're going to cause a worse problem. Um, so I just wanted to point that out because that would be something you run into um, as far as like setup and the different limb lengths. Any other questions or comments on anatomical parts of things i have a kind of observation slash question mark at the end of it which is when we're talking about the femur bone and we we say like long short femur i'm thinking in my mind what it's it's not that it's long or short it's that it's relative to the tibia and fibia it's longer or shorter than than that part of the leg <laughs> bone yeah to the to the person i would say is like even the like better way to put it so basically um, what I'm what, what that leads me to believe in is that it's not so much the height of the person that's gonna um like for me what I'm, the limb actually may be. Yeah, like I'm yeah. shorter, but my femur bone's longer in relation to my tib fib, so my squat isn't as cool looking like Jose's. So that's like why Jose I, I made the, the that's why I made the comment of like I've seen dudes that are six five that can literally sit ass to grass and they're like verticals can be. Um because like all of their body parts measurements are equal to their body. And it wasn't because they just had a long leg. It was, they have everything which is taller. Does that make sense? Um, so that's a, that is a really good observation versus there is a guy at Riptide and he's probably 5'10", 5'11". Rob's about my height, right, Deanna? I think so. He, he's very close to my height. And when you see him put a barbell over his head, it's kind of weird. Because he's literally at the ends of the barbell, and you're like, he's still got a foot above his head. And he's he's my height. If I do that, that bar is like on my head. So he's just got he's got long arms. Um and you can see it in his positions. And like I think his legs are also long, and it's just like relative to his torso, because you even see it in his squat. Like you look at his squat and you're like, there's something with it, but like you look at his points of performances and you're like, it's, they're all there. But it just doesn't look like this. Like if I drew it and I was an artist or Jose, as a <laughs> Jose squad, it just wasn't pretty, you know, like that. Um, so that, that is a really good point and observation. Looking at the deadlift, um, I was just clicking through videos. I I wanted to send you guys like a video and not just a second thing to read. And I came across this James Hobart one, which honestly I loved. I feel like it's cheat code for deadlifts. I thought so, so too. It, it's so simple. Like it, there's nothing complicated about understanding it. He gives you three points and you're, I think if you take those three points, if you don't know how to teach anyone how to deadlift and you just apply that, I think he was probably teaching pretty well. Um, just to review the points. He asked somebody set up. He looks at three things. Are the heels down? As the back lumbar curves, um, the point that he made was like, do we have a curvature? I think is an important point because he also said like, not a flat back, like we actually have where our back is like supposed to lie. Because if you think about it, if you have the S curve and you take the S curve out and now it's flat, we're already losing some of that lumbar support. That person's already starting to curve and they're not totally locked in place. So I think that was a good um, like statement. So heels, lumbar curve, and then shoulders slightly in front of the bar. Is goes one, two, three. I think if you're looking at somebody's setup, you're pretty much going to nail it. Besides, maybe their hands are too wide or maybe their hands are too narrow. Pretty much everything's locked in place. I really liked that he said one of his cues was to bring his chest up even before he started to go down and that automatically made that natural curvature at the, at the lower back. And I was like, 
wow. I mean, I, I never started that way, you know? That's a, a really easy position for people to feel what they mm-hmm. should be doing down there. Yeah. Um, I've used that before. There was an old, speaking of podcasts, do you guys know Barbell Shrug? Mm-hmm. I don't think they're so popular anymore, but they used to be very, very popular probably eight, seven, eight, nine years ago. They were this podcast and it was three dudes. They did the podcast. One of them passed away. So the three dudes, the two other dudes took a break and they brought a CrossFitter, an Olympic weightlifter, and I think an endurance guy on. Um, one of them still does team game, um, teens, like with the uh, teams with games. The other one I think is still a very high level coach, but the weightlifter, that's how he set up. They asked him what his, they were, the episode was on like, um, like rituals and like, how do you step up to the bar? And he, he stood tall. He took a breath, he braced and he went, everything got tight. And then he went down like a robot. Um, he was like, if I don't do that, he was like, I have a hard time finding tension when I'm already bent over. So yeah. if that works, it works. Um, so good, good cue for your pocket. Um, something I like is I try to tell somebody, show me the logo on your shirt or show me your name tag. That's a pretty good one. Um, I think that's a good one too. When you're trying to get the hips and shoulders to rise together too, that's a statement I like to make, but even though this, this video was so simple, I think it's just gold. I think it's such a good tool to use. And if you look at the shoulders and what he's looking at there, this entire measure of a man article, we kind of correct long, short limbs right there. The only thing I will say, I still teach shoulders slightly in front of the bar on like a setup of a snatch and a clean. There is Olympic weightlifting coaches that do like to teach shoulders on top of the bar and it's a stylistic thing. I don't like to teach that because typically I think people end up going around the knees. So I'd rather them be just a hair higher and it's easier to clear versus like trying to sweep around because when you start to do that at heavy clean and snatch loads, a lot of weight goes forward and it gets increasingly more challenging for that frontal plane. Um, But you may hear that at some point in time and you know that that's like a stylistic thing based on like the Olympic camp that they're coming from or who taught them how to Olympic lift potentially. I just think that can be like confusing at a gym when you have one coach telling you to be you know, shoulders on top of the bar and the other one is going on front. Like the athlete's gonna be like, well, like what the what the fuck? You know? It 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 and it <laughs> happened. It it happens. I've I've yeah. been in a gym where where that's happened where I teach shoulders slightly in front and there's another coach teaching shoulders on top. And I mean so much to the point where that coach has said that what I teach is wrong. Yeah. And then and, and it's it's he's not wrong or I'm not wrong. It's just a yeah. stylistic difference. And I think that should be recognized. And if the conversation comes up where the athlete goes you know, this, you know, so-and-so told me this and you told me this. Oh, it's, it's a style thing. Which one feels better for you? Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's, you know, what that's I would the go question. with there. Yeah. Um, because for me, like pushing me down and shoulders like in line with the bar, I feel like I'm going to explode. It's the worst feeling in the world for me. Um, so really just finding comfort while also maintaining all those points of performances. All right. Last thing I want to kind of go through today, I was chatting with Jose about it before we got on the call. I'm actually going to put like a pretty thing to post on Instagram, like going through this. Um, So you guys can kind of look at that once I get it up. That'll kind of summarize what we talk about here. Was a teaching plan for deadlifts. So I wrote out, I told Jose, because he said he still wants to do it. If you guys want to write a teaching plan, it doesn't have to be for deadlifts. It can be for another movement. If you want to write it out and send it to me, go ahead, go ahead. I'll give you individual feedback. It doesn't have to be for this. I have one written out here. Um, so I want to leave it up to you guys. Do you guys want to kind of go through what I have written out on my teaching plan? Or would you like to do it like together and write one out as a class? I say class is like loosely and funny. Any preferences? Wait, you said either show his or do one as a class? Either just go through the one I wrote Um, or kind of go through together and piece it as a Let's go through it together. Okay. I think think that's, yeah. I'm going to start it off. And then you can say what you wrote. Deal. 
I'm going to start it off because even though it's the easiest part of this, for some reason, when I go, what's step one? Everyone's like, uh, I don't know. Okay. You guys are in my class. All right, guys, today we're going to do the deadlift. It's going to look like this. I'm going to deadlift two times. I'm going to change the angle both times that I deadlift. Okay. We're, we're getting going. We're starting out. Class is staring at you. What's next? Stance and grip. Cool. Go ahead, okay. coach. Tell the class. Oh, so feet go right underneath the hips and hands are going to be right outside the hips as well. Or like a thumb away. One more thing. And then you want the bar close to right on your shin. Cool. That could work. Um, I've got... Or shoulders in front of the bar. Sorry. Yeah. Either one could either one could work. Um mine mine's the same, but with more simple dumb down GJ. All right, guys, we're gonna jump in place a couple times. Everyone jumps in uh, place a couple times. Where are their feet? Your feet should now just be right under your hips. Guys, go ahead and take your thumbs, put your thumbs on your sides, measure out with your thumb sticking out, a thumb length away. That's gonna be your grip. Your hands should be right outside of your, your hips. And when we set up, I want your shoulders slightly in front of the bar. I'm immediately, so I've told them, there's my tell. I'm going to immediately show that setup. I'm going to even probably point at my shoulder and draw like an imaginary line so I can see that. And I'm just going to set it. I'm going to stand up and relax. And I'm going to tell them, when I say set, I want you guys to get into that position and hold. So there's our view. So I told them exactly where they need to be. I showed them exactly where they need to be. And then our do is going to be me calling that setup rep. And then the check, tell, um, tell, show, do, check is me coaching all the statics and adjusting. Right? Once I've done that, all right, guys, stand up and relax. That's where I want you to start every single deadlift that we do here. Right? So boom, we've got our doing deadlift today, our demo. We've got our stance, our grip. In our body position, so our, our entire setup. So those three points: stance, grip, body position. What's next? So then you're gonna do the dynamic. So uh, you say um, we're gonna deadlift, and oh. you're gonna go up when I say up, and you're gonna go down when I say down. You're gonna shave your legs. Okay. Perfect. You nailed it, just out of order, I would say. Guys, when we do these deadlifts, I want you to focus on shaving your legs on the way up and the way down. It's going to look like this. You're going to deadlift it. Oh, okay. and, yeah. then, and then when you're standing tall, you can even be like down, and you go down. So you're giving the command of when you want them to move and what you're going to say. So you could, so say, you could say set. Everyone set. You set yourself. You say go. You go. You say down. You go down. So they've, they've literally watched you do the exact rep and the okay. exact command that you okay. want. Right. Because how many, yeah. how many times have we started to try to do that with the class and half the class squats, half the class stands, half the class yeah. squats comes up, half the class sit. Yeah. Like, so now they have a teaching and the exact to do of what you want them to do. Okay. Like um, all right. So, boom. You've got shave your legs. Right. What's mm -hmm. that going to be? Our bar path, the bar has to point of performance of the deadlift is the bar has got to stay over the midfoot, right? So our frontal plane, there's our movement thing. So awesome, got one. Depending how many people are in class are going to be depending how many, how much you do it, right? The do is them doing it. The check is everyone sitting in the bottom, the static, the dynamic, one person. And then top of the deadlift, you don't really have like another static. So I would have them finish. I would probably give my cue to this person. And then when you say down, that would just be like your second static. I mean, you could possibly have a... Um, you could have someone like leaning back or like shrugging or, the shoulders. Yeah, or like they still haven't really stood up. Like they, they have their butt sticking out still. Like they didn't complete the rep. Right, they didn't complete the rep. Yeah, so yeah, you're right. There is another static there. Um, boom, so we've got like layer number one. So that we, we check the point of performance in that. What's another one? Now it's here, here's where like knowing the points of performance is, is gonna really guide you how to coach well. I would say watching their weight down. 
Oh, you mean, yeah, heels. There's one. Drive through heels, same process, right? Um, you could even go as far as saying, like, I want you to wiggle your toes on these reps while you do it. So you, maybe you over-exaggerate them. Um, so there's another. We got two. D. what were you going to say? Oh, I was just going to say to check their dynamic on the way down. I've got that in mind. Oh, hips okay. and shoulders. Yeah. Yep. Um, I would I would go hips and shoulders rise together first. Yeah. Um, because that's like it's like kind of like the line of action. That's how the movement has to start. Um, mm -hmm. when I'm when I'm doing um, these processes and I'm doing these layers, I always like to go. What happens first? Whatever happens first is what I coach first, and then we'll go in order. And sometimes there's so, really no order. It's just things happening at once. But like uh, like hips and shoulders rising together, that would be the first movement of the deadlift that's going to happen. Yeah. Um, if it's a squat, the butt going back and down is the first movement that's going to happen. Um, so it just makes it easier for me to like follow a process. And about what it, about that, that, you know, that I was writing the teaching my teaching plan and I was doing it backwards. So I was like, hey, stand up here show me chest this is the final this is the how the movement stands uh, how the movement ends squeeze your body and get everything tied there and then let's go to your knees and then from knees up going backwards and i've been doing it that the la lately um <clears throat> i don't know like i think it goes like easier which like layering down i've taught i've taught the deadlift from the top down as well like it's just a stylistic thing that you could do that it could be just equally as effective. Um, there's one that I teach that I've done before. I like to do it, especially with new people, because I do think it's easier to get where we don't even have like a bar in our hands. It's just an imaginary bar. And I'm like, okay, bow. They do this good morning. And then I'm like, put your hands on your knees and they rest. And I'm like, that's the position you need to be in there. Because everybody gets, you guys understand the position. I mean, like when you're tired, you're playing a sport. At school, you kind of break, put your hands on your knees, and you bend over. It's an awesome position for, for weightlifting. So then you go, okay, don't fall. Take your hands off your knees. Now just lower yourself, and they lower a little bit, bending their knees. So it teaches them the positions and where they need to be, like in a deadlift or in a clean. Um, so top down can be super effective, too. Not a wrong way to do it. Um, you guys get what I mean by that? Cool. And Nathan, uh, I'll give you a fun fact about the hands on the knees thing. Um, <clears throat> I was listening to um, an audio book recently about um, breathing and the mechanics of breathing. And you may remember this back, like back in the day. Like, I remember. They all you time. Do this. Yeah, they said, don't put your hands on the knees, False. right? <clears throat> yeah. And so the new research has basically said when you do put your hands on the knees, it allows the diaphragm to do less work and you can it's breathe relaxing. freely. Yeah. So it's like, I was giving you all this false information. That's why the point is that it's not even new because it's not new. It's been no. like that for a couple of years. It's just that nobody wants to believe it. No, and we know we know that the the lung is not that you have <laughs> the air on the lung and the blood in the lung at the same in the same way. So if you are in the lower part of the lung, there's more blood, less air, and the upper one is more air, less less blood. When you put it like this way everything gets kind of in the easier. same in the same way yeah so that's why covid patients you have them instead of having them facing up you face them down because then you make like the you move them because then um you make the the lung get every part air and blood makes the so work when you're doing, lying down you everything the, the pressure of everything the air and the blood gets at the same level and everything gets oxygenated and we also have here. more alveoli in the bottom of the lungs uh, versus the top of the lungs. So if we're, if we're breathing in lower belly breathing the way we should be, like in between sets or after um, a wad, then we can recover faster, basically, just through mechanics of breathing. So you could, that, that's a, like, I think that like fun facts like that, especially when working in this position, are like a good good icebreaker point or a good like cool down conversation um to have and teaches people um while we're slightly off topic kobe bryan's trainer tim grover um kobe like had i guess some kind of conversation with him and was like i'm not putting my hands up it's uncomfortable it's easier for me to bend over and then kobe 
also said I always want my shorts to be big enough because I don't even want to put weight on my in my arms. I want to just try to hold something so I don't fall over. So if you ever look at pictures of Kobe when he's like tired, he's always holding his shorts, and his shorts are what's keeping him up, and he's in that same position. Just another fun fact. Um, yeah, all the times I got yelled at for bending over. Yes. I still did it anyway, I'll be honest. Um, all right, so we've got we've got two more. D kind of said one. You could coach the down, right? Jose technically would have coached the down initially, but if you teach it the way like we kind of the route we went about it, I would yeah. also teach the down. I would make sure that they understand it's like this good morning, it's a bend over. Once you clear the knees, a settle, right? I like to use the word settle and not squat. When you say squat, people drop their butt. If you say settle, they just kind of bring it down a little bit. Um, so I would teach that. That would be in my layer. And then the last one, I would either do this first or last, would be like the breathing. I like to do it last because I'm going to be like, okay, we're going to do all of these things, put it all into practice. When I say set up, I want you to set up, take a big breath and get tight. Whatever cue you want to say there, make your belly tight like someone's going to poke it. Deadlift, when you get to the top of your standing, now you can breathe again. Before I say down, you're going to get tight and then go down. Because the moment that bend over starts, we're starting to put sheer force in the spine. Gravity's pushing the weight forward. Um, so you can also teach them if it's a really heavy set of three and they're going to do like a touch and go, they get the breath, they brace. Boom, they touch and go, they stand, they get another breath. Versus you could also still do like a dead stop where they went down, they reset up, they took a breath, and then went again. That would be okay also. Just depends on how they're going to be moving through for the day. Just a Metcon, you're not going to be doing dead stop deadlifts in the middle of your Metcon. You're going to be doing more touch and go. If you're doing it for strength, good idea to probably do a dead stop. It's going to build more strength. So it depends on what the goal is as far as like what I may teach there. Do you have so your hand up? Yeah, because I always get asked, like, where do I breathe when I'm in a Metcon and doing deadlifts? And it's like, I mean, I always tell them just breathe, but keep your core tight. You can't just go, you know, weak in your midsection because I can't. You're not going to be breathing like slowly and like stopping and breathing and going and, and stopping and breathing. And that, that may be the case depends like it goes back to what kind of deadlifts are we doing are right. we doing this like heavy 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 set of load i'm gonna have to stay pretty braced the entire way through and then yeah. get a new breath at the top or get a new breath at the bottom versus if i'm in a metcon and i'm cycling weight if some if it's so heavy where someone can't stay tight and keep this like boxer breath going and keep breathing while maintaining tension that weight's probably way too heavy for yeah them, right like i can breathe through a 225 and stay tight and do a Metcon with it versus if you put the routine on that, that suddenly has turned into a brace, a pull, and then like restart the process. But hey, you look like you're going to say something to that. No, someone called me. Yeah. Oh, okay. I saw you lean forward. <laughs> oh, so um, I have a minute more, one more minute. I have to go into an, another meeting. Sorry. Go ahead. You got one more? Or go ahead. You want to leave? Go. We're pretty much done. Oh, I have one minute. So let's see. Okay. Um, any questions, like, as far as that, like, teaching plan? I'm going to write it out nicely, and I'm going to post it on the Instagram page. So then that way you guys can can see your lats. Yeah. What you were going to say. Yeah, okay, you can throw that in there at some point. You could do it as your own layer. You could do that maybe in your setup. Either one. Well, when you're saying you're shaving your legs, that's when you're... You that could be a really good one. Legs. Yeah. Because technically, like Jose's point, you would be... You know how you like to do your little yeah. uh, trick? Like, that's a yeah. great time to do that little trick in there. Okay. It's all, all the above. I mean, what I want you guys to take away from this is just the process of how you would do it and how you would plan it out. So then when you go to class, you have show, tell, show, they do it, you check it and it's just over and over and over. And then within that over and over and over is if it's a progression or you're layering points of performance, you have your focal points, your focal points, your focal points, not only for the athletes, but you have your focal points for you as well as a coach. If I cued hips and shoulders rise at the same time, 
I'm going to look for hips and shoulders rising at the same time. I'm not necessarily see a, I'm not necessarily going to look for, you know, weight in the heels. If I happen to see weight in the heels, I can go ahead and cue that for the person, but I'm generally going to focus on the focal point that I gave the athletes to focus on. And it's just going to also help not only my teaching delivery, having this plan, but my seeing and correcting by having this plan. Questions on that? Sweet. I'll, um, we I'm could do finish. like, about this, we could do like a teaching plan followed by how we coach. And then I'm like, for example, today I have wall balls. Like yeah. how to perform wall balls and then I will record myself teaching the wall balls. I, I love that. That's a great idea. And, and wall balls is one of those things where like there's a lot of things you can throw in and teach like you can technically teach a squat the hand there's a million things to, to, to go through with that um or it can be one of those movements where coaches are like squat and throw it and they don't do anything so it's a really good one i think to, to, to still do and teach um so yeah if you want to do that jose absolutely i'm game um you guys want to do that for anything um sometimes as an athlete too i even go into like a workout with like an idea of what i'm going to work on um, so yesterday we had really heavy power cleans and my focus was to have a strong receive position to make sure my butt got back and down well and that, you know, I was getting lower as I needed to and happened to almost be on my power clean with like ease. So sometimes having that as an athlete, even though the coach isn't focusing on it, can be really beneficial for your own progress. Um, I'll, I'll finish out the deadlift, uh, like lesson plan, because this is really a lesson plan. Um, I'll finish out the teaching points for that. I'll post them on the Instagram. I'll put the link in our chat. And then, yeah, if you guys want to do, Jose, if you want to do the wall ball, do that. If you want to record it too, we can go through it separately one-on-one -on -one, or, you know, we can do it on the call. Um, I was telling Jose before we call it a day, a lot of this information that I kind of am going through with you guys never got delivered to me. And it was, you know, touched upon when I, you know, went to my level two, but that's a 48 hour weekend. It's very fast. You're under a lot of stress because you're worried about people watching you coach and you know, you're going to get feedback. So don't retain everything. Um, so like going through these processes and like getting taught, getting feedback and even me rewriting them over and over and going in with you guys makes me better. And like when it comes to things for like level four, you, you, if you eventually get to that point, you've had years of practice versus I'm going to sign up and go in six months and go to six months of practice. So I think those things can make a massive difference. And if that's not the goal, which is fine, if it's not, it just makes you a better coach too. Um, so anytime you guys have questions or want to go through any of this, I'm more than happy to. I don't think I have anything else. You guys have anything else before we call it a day? Um, I will see you guys on Thursday then. Justin, I got your video with the snatch, by the way. I think I forgot to like it in the group, but we'll have it on there. All good. All right, y'all. I'll see you. See you.